Can I rack it? We'll, we'll crack on. <laughs> so, so welcome. Thanks for coming tonight. It's great to see some new, some new people as well, some uh, old people. It's fantastic. Um, so we've got a, an evening of lightning talks tonight. Uh, I'll show you the list in a moment. But first, it's, uh, tonight we're going to actually film uh, the talks. So that's a, that's a first for us. And these will end up on uh, the CA YouTube channel. Uh, so looking forward to that. We'll see what we look like. Uh, anyway, uh, but if you go, we, we're not going to film people asking questions. But if you do have a real problem with it, you better make, make a, um, a noise when we're, when we're asking questions, OK? All right, so welcome again. Uh, let's just nip through this. Uh, so most of you have seen this before, what, what the uh, CA is all about. So discussing Lean Agile Methods in Cambridge, uh, regular meetups. So we've been going since October now, I think. OK. Uh, code of conduct, there's sheets around the place, just uh, if you want to familiarise yourselves with those. But basically, just be nice to one another. OK. So, and if you've been l looking at uh, the previous meetups, you'll have seen uh, the activity on, uh, particularly on a, on the night on the Twitter feed. So, probably Ben and, and Simon will be will be uh, adding stuff to there, so you'll be able to catch up and uh, see that there. But also, check out the Facebook page and also the Slack channel. If you've not uh, had an invite, please, uh, we, we should mail some invites out, but uh, just get get in touch with us if you need that. There is an email address. Can't remember where that's got to. So the April event's already up on Eventbrite. Uh, so it's uh, an evening with Matt Jukes, and he's, he's presenting his, his latest talk on openness. So uh, we're hoping that will be a, uh, very well attended. So I, I, I suggest you get your tickets booked as soon as possible. OK, and then uh, in May, we're always looking for suggestions from, uh, from you lot. We want, we want to create a community within Cambridge, and we're very open to uh, suggestions about what we're going to do next. We, have, we have obviously have some ideas, but please uh, speak to us or get, get in touch, like I say, on Slack or in, on Facebook. That would be great. So, uh, I've said another awesome evening of lightning talks. The first one was back in October. No, it wasn't. It was November. That was because I was on the A14 all night, uh, <laughs> stuck, stuck in traffic. But anyway, so I won't, won't go through each talk. But first up is Damien. Okay, Damien, uh, imposter syndrome. So, should we... Uh, should we get, crack, get straight on there? <laughs> Excellent. Round of applause before you start. <laughs> Cheers. Forgot time. Thanks. So I'm hoping this is the most ironic talk of all, because I'm certainly feeling it right now. Um, I'm Damien Ryan. I'm release manager at Feature Space, and I've been doing this sort of nonsense for about two decades, and it never changes. I still feel like I'm going to get called into the office and go, no, you need to go back, you're useless, go away. Um, I think we probably all feel the same way. If not, we're psychopaths. But. <laughs> so, how do you feel every day? Oh, a lot of the times I walk into work, go, I'm saying this, I sound confident sometimes. I'm not really, um, why is anyone listening to me? but I don't know if anyone remembers Animaniacs from the 90s. Basically, there's um, a continuing series of really, really dark cartoons about this chicken who dresses up and everyone thinks he's the best of his job ever until someone notices that he's a chicken <laughs> and he gets run out of town, beaten up and basically destroyed. This is how I feel most days. <laughs> um, Part th so this thing's been around since the 70s. It was first noticed um, by a couple of organizational psychologists who studied women executives who were starting to come up the ranks as the world got better. And they noticed that it's not a trait in people. It's actually a response to stimulus. The, it's seen equally in men and women, although it does affect minorities more. Um, so a lot of the time, you know, we just th think, you know, we, we're not good enough. It manifests like we, we think we have to be perfect. If we make mistakes, we're going to be found out and run out of town like the chicken. So I think the other side of it here is, we all probably all know, is Dunning-Kruger effect, which is kind of the opposite of imposter syndrome. You know, that people who 
don't feel like they've got imposter syndrome tend to overvalue their own experience and know what they've got. And they they um, think they're perfect at their job, like Mr. Brent there. Um, to actually know how good you are at something, you need to be good at that thing, which is where we get up to here. If we don't know, we don't have the expertise or the knowledge of what we're doing, we end up thinking we're the best until we kind of figure out that we're not. We end up in the valley of despair. And then there's a long, long crawl up until we actually know we're good at things and we're an expert. So I don't know, how can we stop this? So the answer is we really can't. Um, it's normal. It's human. Um, I'm telling myself this right now. I'm really feeling it. Uh, but we have to keep telling ourselves that if we don't fail, we've never learned anything, and we can never get past men stupid. Um, one thing, things that do help is like trying to keep data, so keeping a log of things that you've actually done well in, and looking back on that log, as well as getting feedback from your peers, say, look, am I being stupid or am I being good? And the most important thing of all is really be kind to yourself, to your colleagues, and just sit with empathy. And that's basically it. Right. So that's, that's quite quick, David. So I, plenty yeah. of time for questions. Hello? Oh, okay. Oh, I can talk. Right. I completely agree with your talk, and I think it's actually quite relevant. Not many people pay attention to, the, to this kind of mindset, but my question would be, we need to give room for failure. Like you said, we need sometimes to go through the valley of the shadows to actually reach our potential. But the problem for me is the conflict with the other people around you. Um, do you find that, do you struggle to find, let's say, compassion when you're actually going through a moment where you know that you're going to get over, but may much, some people might not understand? Oh, definitely. I mean, I struggle with both sides, giving compassion and finding compassion. And I tend to hide everything under a rock as soon as I watch. So it is a daily struggle to say, look, I've made a mistake. And again, when someone else says they've made a mistake, it's, it is a struggle not to turn totally grumpy and yell at them. And I think empathy is a practice, and we have to work at every day. It's... Uh, you said it's natural to go through that progression, but do you think some people get to the top of Mount Stupid and stick a flag in and stay there? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> I, I can provide a list, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> so when you become a bad manager. I've met one good manager in my life. But. Yeah. I can project, it's okay. I'm okay. Sure I can <laughs> um, okay. Thank you so much. I totally agree with your talk. I particularly love that you said collect data, because sort of as the data nerd, probably not the only data hmm. nerd in this room, um, I think data is a solution to a lot of actually personal things as well. And I was wondering what recommendations do you have in terms of that data collection? Like, what do you personally use to attract that? So for me, I have things like victory logs. So every time, even the tiniest little thing that went well, you write it down. And it's always good to go back and look at this once a quarter thing. Because day to day, you think I've done a little bit. You don't really notice it. If you go back over a quarter and think, well, I have actually done a lot of these things and got through a lot. You know, everything else I'm feeling, maybe not so. Um, yeah, well, for me, I, I tend to go qualitative. I like that. But uh, whatever works for you. But it's always important to recognize that not everything is bad, not everything is good. 
So keeping both sides to try and keep an even keel. Because if you, if you go thinking, oh yeah, it's all imposter syndrome, everything's fine, you'll forget that sometimes you might be stuck on Mount Stupid. I'm going to try and check now as well. So <laughs> the, the, the other I guess, thing I get sometimes is like nodding dog syndrome. And, and you're talking to people who are peers, managers, senior managers, whatever, mm. and they're nodding, going, yeah, you're doing really well here. And you feel like you're in the slow lane and people are cycling past you. And you go, yeah, you're doing really well, keep it up. Go, what, what have I done right? You're almost waiting for that moment mm. so I can fail. So you go, ah, now I know where it breaks and I can fix it. Yeah, yeah. So that's the kind of the inverse. But how do people recognize that? No. <laughs> Uh, for me, I think as well, feedback, not just from managers, from everyone, you know, and trying to foster that culture of feedback, and that's the hardest part, it's an organisational problem, that we're, I think we're all trained to be, not be too honest with each other, for fear of being too honest with each other. Yeah. But again, it goes back to data, you know, data from peers, data from yourself, just trying to find out exactly where we are because we're all just a collection of biases and we can't think, you know, we're, we're really all just Savannah apes in the end, you know. Okay, last yeah. question. Um, yeah, I again, totally agree with what you've been saying. I often feel like that, but do you think with an agile perspective on this, do you think this applies to teams' development as well as individuals and how they behave? And oh, for sure, yeah. I mean, a lot of the things that apply to individuals kind of roll up and apply to teams themselves. Like things like we talk about halo effect, where you you got a person can do no wrong. Um, there's a thing like the team halo effect, where the team themselves can do no wrong. Uh, I think some teams, yeah, can think they're not doing anything right, and the, the team as an organism probably as well needs to collect data and you know, celebrate celebrate the wins. And that that's kind of a bit what some of the ceremonies are about. That no matter how small a thing you've done in two weeks, celebrate it. And also, you know, commiserate the losses. I guess we yeah. introduce that failure thing earlier as well, so that we can learn. That's our mm. Yeah. As I think 90% of it is empathy. Yeah. Uh, empathy as people, empathy as teams, just not being arseholes, really. <laughs> and, the, and the rest of it is being honest with each other and trying to just figure out where we are and not kidding ourselves either way. Um, I'm a team of one, right. so I do, but I probably should actually, that's a, re that's a really good idea. <laughs> okay, uh, we're going to have time at the end as well, we're going to have a little panel session, so don't worry, you'll get a chance, if you've got any more questions, you'll get a chance at the end to ask them, okay? So next up, thanks Damien, Very, that's brilliant. <laughs> Cheers. Mike, you're on. Here we go. Uh, can you Hello. Oh. So I don't do slides. <laughs> I'm going to wheel this over. <laughs> oh. Anyway, switching that off. Cheers. That's what it's going off. So, excellent. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm going to try and fit this into 10 minutes. We've started already. Five seconds. <laughs> off we go. So, I'm going to try and combine three techniques that I use regularly, and maybe you'll want to try them yourself back at base. So, number one, this is all going to hang around causal loop diagrams. So, it's great to have a tool which you can use to talk about organizational change, something you might want to change in the business, you want to discuss with your colleagues. I generally use this technique to um, have a discussion with people, but you can also use it to pitch ideas to people. So um, the no, so we're talking about causal loop diagrams. Diagrams. And I think you can see green better than black, but maybe not. Uh, so the notation is if A is going to have a positive impact on B, A is going to make B stronger, then let's use an arrow. If A is going to reduce B, the notation is use no for an opposite effect. 
A is going to have a um, is going to change B, but it's, uh, it, there's going to be a delay in there. We use the, this notation. There's a gap there. You can stick opposite in. If A impacts B, but um, we've got a constraint in there. Typical, typical uh, reasons being, hey, we've only got enough cash to get so much of B. We use, use C just to say there's only so, so far we can push B. And the other one is, because we're using this as a conversation piece, occasionally as a group we might not understand how A impacts B. Does it go up or down? Let's leave it at that. We'll, we'll walk away and discuss it at a later date. So where's my rubber? <laughs> Uh, here we go. So, um, giving feedback to people, you might want to pitch an idea. You want to want to tell people how did that how did that impact them, um, and give some feedback so you can make some improvements in the future. So, number two, uh, impact feedback. You can tie all this together. You might want to get this into your organization, so it's just natural to give feedback to people um, and go go first yourself, so you, you um, open up the organization to, to improvement. So I've got this down. So a good framework to use is situation, behavior, and <coughs> impact. So this is the how. Why do we want to structure it like this? We, we, what we try to do is keep opinion, opinion out of it. So that this is us avoiding making any assumptions about uh, why this behavior perhaps happened. So an example might be that uh, in, a planning, um, in a planning session today, um, you weren't really en engaged with the conversation. The impact was that I don't think we've come out with the best plan that we, we could have. And at this point, you might just leave that with the, uh, the, the client, the person that you're de delivering this to, or there might, a conversation might, might come about. But you wouldn't say, in planning today, you were asleep. Perhaps you should get an early night um, and come back tomorrow in a better mood. So you, you don't want to make any uh, assumptions about what's going on. Let them, let them dig into that, because they've, they've got all the information. So it's a bit of a, it's a coaching technique. Uh, finally, what's the time? I've got loads of time here. Hey? Three. Um, the five minute pitch. So, um, went to, I went on Lisa Adkins' course on um, agile coaching. She uses this to, to promote the idea that uh, every agile coach or scrum master should should know their um, agile frameworks and be able to to talk about them. Um, so that got me using the idea of a pitch when I wanted wanted to make a change to to develop an idea. So that's the first point. So why would you want to give? five or 10 minute pitches, well, it's access to people. Sometimes they're time limited, especially if you, say if you go higher up the food chain, maybe they haven't got, got enough time to deal with you. You maybe want to develop the idea. Um, so instead of spending lots of time as a group, sometimes there's a benefit in uh, going one-to-one -one with people, getting some more information, making the idea better. Uh, and how should you do it? It should be, I think, interactive. Uh, and that's why I'd always favor the whiteboard. So here's a demonstration of me using a whiteboard. Um, and that allow, allows you to have an engaging conversation with the person that you're trying to present this idea to. They feel like they own the idea because they've got involved in the conversation. They're able to kind of question things as they develop on the board. So, here's something that you, a situation that you could try and pitch to somebody. So number four is the actual pitch. So, this is a causal loop diagram. So, um, you, 
you might hear people talking about productivity. We might be, um, so th this is me giving a, a pitch to someone who's making decisions about how we uh, resource the department. So, hey, I hear, <laughs> hear you, you're thinking about doing something about, about our feature velocity, and the way you're going to do, deal with that is to hire more developers. So we've got an assumption here that adding more developers is going to increase our feature velocity. We're going to get more stuff done. I would suggest that, yeah, it might. Um, that might be the case, but it, it's going to have a bit of a delayed impact. I also hear <laughs> that we've got some constraints here. So we, we haven't got a lot of cash. And the market for de developers is, uh, is not very wide at the moment. We're not getting ma many people coming through. So that puts a, some constraints in here. I've also, there's a danger then that perhaps we're going to get some low quality of developers. I could start making, uh, making some assumptions here, but there's a good chance that this, this doesn't actually help. But, you know, all bets are off. Let's just say it's uh, questionable what's going to go on here. But I've been talking to the teams, and um, um, we've come up with some data. That <coughs> our defects are on the way up. And that's probably affecting our feature velocity, so as defects go up, <coughs> our feature, vel feature velocity stays, stays still. Done some more, more digging. And um, code quality and architecture seem to be suffering too. Um, as code quality goes down, we get more defects. So we've been looking into why that's happening. And so we're getting a lot of you know, pressure to go faster. And um, so we're not spending much time on making improvements. Um, so as the pressure increases, time to make improvements goes down. And um, time is spending on code quality um, that gets hurt time. Da, 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 da. I think that's right. So things are only going to get worse when we bring these people in. Perhaps a delayed effect too. Um, so my suggestion is that we get rid of this <laughs> these new devs coming in. Um, spend some more time on code quality. So that would mean let's re reduce the pressure but I there will be initially an issue with feature velocity we spend more more time on code quality you're going to take a hit here but the good news is <laughs> as code, code, code quality goes up we get to spend we're going to be spending less time on this stuff so let's do that maybe in the long term uh, we ease a few more developers in or squeezing a new, new team, and that will help. So that's me. Perfect. On 10 minutes. Perfect, Midas. Bang on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I think we've got time for a couple of questions. Sorry. Yeah, I'm just going to add, you might be wondering how impact fee feedback fees in. So here's your chance. A <laughs> <laughs> couple of questions for the next talk. Mike, do you hear that? Sorry. Did it work? Oh. Did it work? Does this work? Yeah, I've done it from time. What? What this? That particular bit. <clears throat> no, because I've never actually done that one in real life. <laughs> <laughs> but I've done many others. But that's that's one of the classic ones from. For, if you if you look for uh, doc, uh, docs on causal loop diagrams, you'll come across that. Yeah. Uh, but it's still not well understood. I've been involved in a project this month where. We've done exactly this. Uh, we brought more people in and expected things to go much better. Yeah. Like yeah. yeah. Quick than me as well. Pardon? No. 
quicker than meeting, we'll try and work out what meeting mm -hmm. framework. It's quite, yeah, it's quite sharp. Yeah. So it's great for just having, get, getting people together and um, knocking, knocking about a problem. I think that the point is even with kind of five or six nodes on the board, having a common understanding of how those things interrelate becomes really difficult, even when you're working on your own. Yeah. Yeah. All right, brilliant. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mike. Uh -huh. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> right, next up, Danny Oliver, uh, an extreme case study. Hi. Cheers, Danny. Cheers. Where is the uh, control of the slides? Uh, did I just do? I clean my pocket. Here we go. There we go. So just, uh, That's me. Oh, my camera take good, takes a good picture, though, doesn't it? Right. Uh, first of all, apologies if I make a lot of mistakes. I'm not really used to talking in front of an audience. Mina sama, konbanwa. Daniel to mo shimasu. Kyo no hanashi wa gakoku kara no hataraku to iu desu. Yoroshiku o negai itashimasu. And before you freak out, I'm not going to do my speech in Japanese, but it's very related to this extreme case study. The title is actually Working Abroad, an extreme case study. And it relates an experience that I had working for a whole month, um, working from Japan while I was achieving a personal goal. And my company, my company actually sponsored me in order to do that. So uh, as I... As I just said, the, uh, the data is very important because we, I could spend a whole month in Tokyo without, with no need whatsoever of asking any holidays. And I needed to work my regular working hours, but at the same time, I needed to attend an academy where I was uh, achieving uh, basically an upper intermediate course of Japanese. Um, and in order to do that, I really struggled with time and I had to be extremely uh, disciplined when it comes to my timing um, and I was very hard at the end of the month I couldn't almost I couldn't almost wait to come back but now obviously I'm going to relate it by the end of the talk to what it means when it comes to agility about the resilience and what it means to be actually productive so this is the key data I'm not going to read all the um, elements but essentially I had to deal in a very extreme way with the time difference working eight hours having to study, do my homework, and all, doing all that, living in a real house in the outside of, of Tokyo, and it's not precisely an easy city to move around, if you, some of you have ever been there. And on top of all that, I was a team leader, and, I, and there was a lot of work to be done. So, you go to Japan, and then you have an image. Oh, let's eat sushi, let's go have beautiful views, but the reality is that I had to deal with the 36 million people that move around Tokyo every day, so my hopes of actually doing things in the train were completely uh, demolished the first day that I actually went there in, in, in rush hour. And then on top of all that and doing my regular work, I had to express myself in Japanese all the time because that was the, the whole point, right? Now, this was my daily routine. <laughs> I had to wake up, do my ofudo. I had to start working, which actually was the best time for me because it was nighttime in the UK then go ready for the academy, be there on time, three hours of, the, of intense Japanese class, return home, do my daily scrum, daily stand-up at 5.30 p.m. because I was 9.30 in the UK, then keep working, have my dinner, keep working, and then go to bed if I was lucky because I tried to do it in a way that I would sleep eight hours, but sometimes, and, I, and, and this is a true story, I would have to do Skype meetings while in bed, literally with my iPad talking to people while in bed. So it was quite tough. So you can imagine that by doing this every day, it was a quite hard experience. So this was essentially me at the end of every day. This is actually quite accurate in Tokyo. Um, now, let's talk about the impediments. You would have obviously everything that's about uh, the logistics, in connection, internet, improvised offices, let's go to a Starbucks, keep doing this, begging the people in the academy, oh, come, can, can I get connected because I need to have my stand up with my guys through Skype? I would have to do the technical support that I would need sometimes, and I wouldn't, that was not possible. So I was 9 a.m. in Japan, so who could I contact if I needed troubleshooting? Everybody was sleeping in the UK, so that was not possible. Um, and then, of course, the productivity. Can you actually be productive under such extreme conditions? You're mentally exhausted, you need to actually do a lot of work, and you are expected to do so. So we'll talk about it now on the next slide. 
One does not simply get rid of impact. And what does that mean? Impact on who? Or impact on what? Well, it's literally on everything. It's impact on yourself, impact on the people around you. What does it mean that you are isolated, literally on the other side of the world, and people actually depend and count on you? you and, and I was a team leader, and I was also doing a pseudo scrum master. Now I am a proper scrum master. But the point is that people depended on me. So I had that extra pressure on top of achieving my personal goals. Now, it's been four years since, it, since this, this happened, so I've had a lot of time to think about it and what it means for me as a professional to be able to do this under the conditions that I had it. And this is what the whole, this whole speech is about. The good side, the dark side, and basically ask yourself and the people around you whether you can actually be that flexible. Can you? So I'm not gonna read the bullet points because I actually hate when I'm in the middle of a talk and then I'm literally, and I did this and I did that, no. But I'm gonna stop on some of the points and if you actually want to ask me some questions later, I'm, I'm happy to take those questions. So obviously the pros are the absolute freedom of schedule, being able to work whatever you wanted. If you can, you can avoid the distraction. And the most important point, productivity versus working hours. What does it mean nowadays, 7.5 hours a day, Monday to Friday? That's, that doesn't make any sense at all. Not anymore, not in the industry that we work on. We can be more flexible. And yes, we know that we have bendy time and that we can do this, we can work from home sometime, but can we actually accept it and take it to the next level? Is actually people ready to do that? And to be honest, there have been days where I've done nothing. I've been in the office for seven hours and I was not productive at all. Why? What does it mean to be productive nowadays? And then of course, the cons. If you work from home and you work in an environment that is actually your personal environment or the environment that you have chosen, you will have your whole, your, your life, your personal life and you work in the same location. Sometimes you will not be able to disconnect. You can actually face one of the biggest struggles which is the isolation. And I've never really worked from home all the time, but I have some friends that actually work from home permanently, and this is the first thing that they always mention, that they feel alone. That basically proves that we, need, we have a need for interaction, real interaction, not a Skype meeting. So there's something that you need to have into account. The domestic distractions. Are you actually productive? How many times have you been working from home and you make, people make a joke, yeah, yeah, working from home. And the reality is that sometimes you maybe take more breaks than you should, but, or not, it depends. It's up to you to decide what being productive means. And one that actually relates to the first talk we had today, the nine to five addicts. Some people just work better under those conditions. We all work the same way, or that's the illusion, at least. Not many people are ready to live. No, why is this person living earlier than me? Why is that person working from home more days? There is no empathy. Or maybe that person, I mean, no, for personal reason, need to take care of someone, or because my wife is living far away, or I don't know, you don't really know. But not many people can actually be prepared to have their peer colleagues doing things in a different way, or so they think. To me, having this experience gave me many opportunities. Now that I could actually um, inspect on, on how I, what gave me personally is that I could have a proper exercise on how to improve my intention and my focus, the discipline. Reduce the stress, that's a possibility if you don't do it under such extreme conditions. Because sometimes you can just be home and relax, right? It also provides, an, let's say, social benefit, which is reducing the company costs and the environment. Not many, less people on the train, on the bus. That's obviously something that we need to have a look at as a society. But my experience made me realize that I am not such a good professional in the sense that I need more interaction than the, the one that I had, that sometimes it is very difficult to meet all those pressures, because obviously if you're not there, you have an extra pressure, which is not being there and not being able to um, be up to the circumstances, if that makes sense. 
and um, basically the technical impediments. But my company sponsored me to do that. They did not have to do that. They, they, that was not something that was required. Learning Japanese was not something that my company had in mind as a goal for me, but they paid my flights. They did not pay the training, but they allowed me to do that for a month and achieve a personal goal and trust in me. And that is the whole point. And that's also related to Agile. What does it mean for me and the personal impact in terms of um, um, engagement? If my company trusts me so badly, then I'm going to f fall in love with them, fall in love with my company, because they trust me. And I actually managed to be as productive as I could have. Maybe I would not repeat it under such extreme conditions, but I definitely would. I, I, I definitely felt really engaged with my company and very proud. And even though I don't work with them anymore, I still see them every week. I still go see them. I see my colleagues every day, my ex-colleagues. So, and last but not least, and it's very important, doing this regularly will make you improve on all these practices. Now, just to, as a conclusion, um, you can do many things like this. You can be truly flexible and not just an illusion real flexibility. It's possible, but it has a cost, a personal cost to do that. And we need to remember that we all in here work, can work in different ways. We are all different. And our way of working also is different. We are productive in different ways, but what does it mean as a team or as, as a collective group if we actually can understand each other? I mean, I believe that if we manage to be so flexible with each other as well, we would actually reach proper productivity. And obviously, related to that previous point, the working hours nowadays is a completely useless concept. I do not believe that if you work 7.5 hours, you've actually worked 7.5 hours. It's about the goals, it's not about the time. So again, like I said, the companies that really trust their employees, they, that's the, their best weapon when it comes to engagement. It's about trust. Trust your employee. Trust that they will actually deliver your goals, and that's when you will be truly agile. Last but not least, some pictures of my actual experience. And this is, uh, it might sound like funny, but this is actually very late. This is my team when I had my stand-ups with them. This is in the academy when I achieved my, my, my diploma by the end of it. And I made really long-lasting relationships. This lovely lady here is my Japanese mom, Harumi. And it not only made me, it was not just a really fulfilling professional activity, because it was, but also a personal one. I grew as a professional and I grew as a person. And I think these kind of experiences can be magical. So this is something to reflect on. The question is, and this is actually a question, are you, re are you ready, guys, all to be that flexible and to actually be able to work remotely and allow your peer colleagues to work in a different way than you do? Can you actually accept it? Thank you very much. Arigatou gozaimasu. Hey. Thanks very much, Danny. Excellent. Uh, again, time for a couple of questions. Can we, can we try the mic again? <laughs> just because just of the videoing. Thank you. Hello. Danny, thank you. Um, yes. You lasted a month. How long would you have lasted before you went insane? <laughs> <laughs> Um, luckily, we had the weekends in between, and you saw a picture where I could actually get away to a proper onsen in the mountains. But if I hadn't had the weekends, uh, actually, by, by third week, I, 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 was, I was exhausted. I was brain dead at the end of every day. And I mean really brain dead. I, I have never slept better in my life, really. Imagine, after, after switching languages as well, speaking Japanese half of a day and then switching to English, which is not even my <laughs> first language either. I'm Spanish. so. <laughs> I think it's quite interesting that you uh, brought up the, the stuff about seven and a half uh, hours in a day and what, what's the point in all that. But actually, we're paid for doing seven and a half hours a day. And if you take that to what uh, happens with agile t delivery teams, when, how, how often do you work on a contract where you're paid for an outcome and not for the time that it takes to do it? But unfortunately, so the whole commercial argument that's going to back and, up what you need to do. To and not work. only that, if I had worked a long, longer than that, there are legal impediments. There are, there are boundaries, but that would be, basically it's law. It's boundaries that we need to fight against. But the reality and the common sense tells me that working hours is a completely useless concept. Some days you are in the office for 7.4 hours, you do nothing. And at the same time, you can be working like for three. You know, so it's about goals, in my opinion. But I agree that there needs 
There are boundaries. Yeah, we, we just need to find a better way of paying people for achieving their yeah, goals yeah, yeah. rather than their time. It's not an easy topic. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Thank you. So. <laughs> Cheers, Danny. Okay, and over to Ben for uh, Death Sim. Death Sim, <laughs> there you go. Okay. Can I have the click? Yes, oh, for the moment. You keep pinching I keep putting it away. Yeah. Okay, so I'm here to talk about Def Sims. So, who here manages a team or has managed a team? Yeah, a few of you. Okay, so my talk is about why killing off half your team could provide you useful insight. So, how many of you have wanted to kill any of your team? Put your hand up. Come on, be honest. Right yep, every day. <laughs> and I'm only saying that because my team aren't here, I think. Yep. Um, but bit of background before we get into this. So this talk was something that I saw at Lean Agile Scotland in 2017, so October last year, uh, done by this lady, Helen Lizowski. Uh, so she's been an Agile coach for about 10 years. Uh, she uses a mix of psychology and behavioural science to kind of work with her teams. Um, has anyone done the Am I a Psycho test? So it's something that's on Facebook. No doubt Cambridge Analytics have probably stolen your details if, if you have done it. Um, but has anyone done that test? No? Okay, so I've done it. Um, I came out as a psycho, which I'm not sure if I'm pleased or sad about that, but anyway, so I've done that test. So there's a test that you can do to check whether you're a psycho. Um, I promise you my team don't mind working with me. But um, Helen kind of works with teams using more of a, a psychological approach to coaching them, which is probably a good thing, to be honest. So she did this talk at, at Lean Agile Scotland on the, what she called the chaos lottery. But me, I actually prefer calling it death sims because I kind of think at the end of a really bad day, how many of us don't really want to maybe pick off one of our team and kind of feel a little bit better about it? I'm joking? Maybe? Okay. So... What are Def Sims? So these actually come from NASA. So does anyone remember Chris Hadfield? Yeah, he did the um, David Bowie song in, in space, you know, playing the guitar. Yeah, so he wrote a book about this Def Sims approach that NASA use. Um, and um, what they actually do is use it to kind of train their astronauts to deal with unexpected events. <laughs> so one of the most obvious ways that they kind of do this is what happens if an astronaut dies in space? It isn't like aliens or anything else you've seen where they just fire them out of the chute. They do actually have to bring these bodies back. So it's about how they dealt with situations like that that are unexpected and suddenly appear. And how do you deal with that? You know, if there's three of you in space in a, a quite self-contained um, space station and one of you dies, what's the first thing you're going to be thinking about if that person dies? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you could suddenly resort to cannibalism, I guess. Um, maybe you'd come under the psycho test at that point, I don't know. Um, but where are you going to store the body? It, it has to come back. So, you know, do we now need to transport some body bags out to the space, um, the space station? And if that's the case, they take up room. So where do they go? Do we kind of put them next to the utensils and, you know, the, the food? Or do we kind of keep them out of the way? So what happens uh, when those sorts of situations possibly happen? The great thing is we can also use this with our software teams as well. And this is something I'm about to do with one of my teams. So if the, one of my teams is going to watch this video afterwards, um, be prepared because I'm going to kill one of you at some point. Um, but it's called Chaos Lottery. I still prefer Death Sims because I kind of think it, it means a bit more. Um, so how this game actually goes with NASA is that their astronauts will come into uh, you know, the, the space centre, they'll come into the building, and did anyone play Dungeon Master when they were a kid? Yeah, okay, so I'm not the only geek here, that's great. Okay, so Dungeon Master is a fictitious game that you just create yourself, so you maybe have a couple of characters, but you've got a Dungeon Master who is in charge of that game, he's the one that makes the rules, so he will say, you're about to face an orc, and uh, you know the orc attacks you with a crossbow, and normally at that point I'd die and I'd be out of the game and watch all my friends play for the next four hours, but um, the Dungeon Master controls the entire game, he sets the rules, and this is what happens at NASA, so the astronauts will walk into the building, and all of a sudden, poor Chris has suddenly lost the use of his right arm. So what do the rest of the astronauts do to cope with that situation? And if they're on the space station, well, actually, sorry, but Astro Fred over there has suddenly died of um, ammonia poisoning. What do you do now? How do you deal with that situation? And the game progresses and progresses, and the, the games master will then chuck in some real left-field situations. So if that astronaut has died in space, 
First of all, how do you dispose of the body? Secondly, how do we share that information with the wider public? Oh, and by the way, the press have just got wind of the fact that an astronaut's died, and they're waiting outside the astronaut's child's school. How do we deal with that? Oh, and by the way, his wife is actually in the mountains camping right now, and she's out of mobile coverage range. We're going to have to go out there and contact her face to face. So who's going to go and do that? And this game progresses and progresses, and everyone gets involved, so ground control get involved with this as well, and they play the game all the way through these different scenarios. So, so why do we use it in software? A couple of good reasons for that. Teams that have good habit, habits are successful. Who disagrees with that here? No one. Good, okay, because that would have kind of spoiled the talk a little bit. But... Um, it's true. Teams that have those good habits are really successful. So the teams that do things like pairing and build maintainable code and do the right stuff are successful. They're not the teams that suddenly have to deal with massive quality issues or create technical debt. They're the teams that will ship frequently. They'll ship value. They'll work together and collaborate. They're successful. What happens, though, if a team has these best intentions but doesn't actually carry them out? So, good example for you. Who has heard some of these phrases before from a team? We couldn't create tests this time, but don't worry, we'll do it next time. Who's heard that? Put your hand up if you've heard that. Yeah, I've heard that. Okay, who has had this asked of one of their teams before? Can we just squeeze in this extra feature in this sprint? Yeah, okay, every, yeah, we're getting there now. See, this is a bit of counselling for all of us. Um, we won't do that again. Who's heard that one? Yeah, okay, everyone's heard that one as well. So we hear all of these things from our teams and we just kind of skip over them. But actually, all of these are examples of best intentions being left behind. So we probably won't create those tests next time. Do you know what? We probably will allow another feature to be squeezed in next time and the time after that. And yes, we didn't do it this time. And do you know what? We're probably not going to do it for the next two or three sprints as well because we're busy. And if we stop working, people are going to ask us what we're doing. So habits are really tough for us to form, but they are how our teams become successful. So how does this actually work? Um, so I'm going to give you a step-by-step -step guide now on how this works. There are a few caveats to this, by the way, that you need to be aware of. So you can't just go in tomorrow and shoot two of your team. First of all, that's murder. Secondly, your team are not going to appreciate that, so you may have an issue at your next retrospective when that comes up and you can't really explain why you did it. But some important things. The business absolutely needs to know what you're doing with this because you are potentially going to be impacting the effectiveness of your team when you do this. You should do it for more than a couple of days because how many of you here have had teams where someone's rung in sick or has had to have emergency holiday? Yeah, all of us have had that. If you just do this for a day, the team have probably got a bit of resiliency built into them anyway. So if someone's sick for a day, if your test is off for a couple of days, if someone's cat has died, um, people can deal with that. It's where you suddenly lose someone for a week or two weeks that that actually tests the metal of your team. So you want to think about that when you're starting to plan this. Uh, how do you convince your stakeholders with this? Well, a good explanation is that we're actually looking to identify improvements in our processes. So that's a way to sell this to your stakeholders if they suddenly ask why you're taking two people off your project. There is never a good time to do this, but that's the point. You want to test your team when it isn't a good time, not when it is a great time to do this. So for the unlucky people who win Def Sims, which means we're killing them off, they actually have to have something rewarding to do. You can't just kill them and stick them in a room. Again, the police may come and investigate you for that. So you actually have to give them something to do. So maybe for a couple of weeks, do a two-week spike on something that that team are interested in. Get a group of them together to look at your processes, for example, or to look at a particularly knotty issue and just say, you've got two weeks to go and fix that for us. So they need something to be doing whilst this is going on. So two of your team are dead. You're playing Def Sims. So select a couple of those teams. Select a single team member, or you could be a real bastard and you could select two or three of that team. Um, and those are the winners of the Def Sim. They've got five minutes to shut up shop. That means getting the PC off their desk, getting the laptop off their desk, disconnecting. They are out of the game when it comes to their team. The rest of the team now have to cope with the fact that they are a team member down or a couple of team members down. So what's going to happen at this point? 
So if a team is already experiencing these good habits and they're successful, well, this shouldn't be a problem, should it? If we're already pairing, then we can just pair with someone else. If our tester is one of these people that's been hit by the deaf sim train, then actually the rest of our developers can test anyway. So the fact that the developers and the testers work closely together anyway means we don't necessarily need the tester there all the time because we can test as well. So it shouldn't be a problem. If you're regularly checking in code and you lose the developer that normally does that for you, well, that shouldn't be a problem, should it? Because we've got other people in the team that can check that code in. We're checking in frequently. It doesn't become an issue. This is where you start to see the breaks in your processes. So you could do that for a week or two. Um, the people that won the game have obviously gone away and they've had some fun, they've done some stuff for a couple of weeks that's been effective or has been useful for your business or for your teams whilst the teams are trying to cope. You're looking for those breakages in that process. Now, if your team have got good habits, you're not going to see those because they can cope with these sorts of situations. But for most teams, you are going to see them start to struggle after the first couple of days. And that's what Def Sims is about. It's about identifying those issues across your teams. If you wipe out a tester, can the developers actually test without the tester? Or do they fall apart? Because that's probably an area that you want to look at if that's the case. So what are we trying to prove with Def Sims? That's quite true, I think. So I, I do think occasionally wiping out some of your team can be quite useful, particularly when you're trying to test something like this. It does prove those good habits because we can all hear our teams tell us that, yes, we are great at code quality, we're great at maintainable code, we're great at pairing. It's only when you take the person they're pairing away from that actually you find out whether that's the case. Can they do it with someone else? Can someone else check in the code? Can you test without a tester? Maybe. It really does help you zero in on those areas for improvement because, yes, right now I could go and say to one of my teams, I think you need to work on your maintainable code. If they actually feel that for themselves where they haven't got their developer that's the one that normally reminds them to check in frequently or reminds them that they need to do a code review before something's committed, then that's where you start to feel. Um, it does encourage continuous improvement and inspecting and adapting as well. I'm going to speed up a little bit now because I'm going over a little bit. Uh, and it is a great discovery tool for teams as well. So it's great for teams to go through this and experiencing it rather than us just telling them areas to improve because the teams find this out for themselves instead. And that's it. No questions? Uh, sure. Oh. sure. So, um, so I'm, I'm, I think it does, but uh, does this, is it different from somebody just being on holiday for a week or two weeks? And the second question is, what happens if things are much better during the time that the <laughs> other person's not there? You're opening up a can of worms there. So, so if someone's on holiday, normally that's planned for. So if someone's booking off a holiday, most teams kind of say, look, if you're, if you're going off for more than a week, just give us a bit of notice and people can plan around that. Um, this is really where you just walk into the team one day and say, right, you two, out of the team. For the next week, go and have some fun over there. Go and work with one of our other teams on a knotty problem for us. It's that instant, someone's going to be off for a period of time and we don't know when they're going to be back and we haven't planned for it. That's what we're trying to do with Def Sims. Holidays, yeah, we can all plan around those. Um, if it's better when they're not there, um, we probably need to look at how that team's working effectively together. Um, that, that's a possible anti-pattern um, that I'd suggest you probably want to have a chat with that team about. Ideally together, don't leave out the person who kind of went away and it all got better. That needs to be a discussion across the entire team. One more. Can you do the same with problematic managers of the team as well? Yeah, I'm, I'm, do you know what? If we reverse this, I'm sure most of my teams would at some point, hopefully occasionally, like to kill me as well. Um, and not all the time. But yeah, yeah, you could do this with managers as well. Um, what happens if you wipe out all of your C-level team? I personally think we'd probably get on quite well. Um, maybe they'd disagree. <laughs> um, I'm hoping that my C-level team here don't no, see no. that. But um, yeah, so you can, you can absolutely do this with any team. It doesn't have to be a development team. You can do this with a UX team. You can do this with a test team. What happens if you take out the lead tester or the test manager? Could be a, an experiment to try. So yes. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks again.
<laughs> right, next up, Marcus. Visualizations for teams. I thought you were going to change that. No, I had to switch this thing up. Is that on now? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Hello, slightly different slide format now. I don't like PowerPoint. Usually I do this from uh, Google Photos as an album because um, I draw them. Uh, I can't draw fast enough to draw them on a whiteboard, however, although I am known to draw them on our whiteboards at work. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is uh, visualizations for teams, uh, or the subtitle is or why, why whiteboards shouldn't be boring. Oh, wrong way. So we'll start at the top. You've got your scrum board. What can you do with your cards? Well, cards are interesting. Post-its, they come in many sizes, many colors. Uh, they also come in different shapes. Uh, a useful tip. So if you've got just these square ones, actually diamonds as well. Um, but let's say you're putting your stories on cards on your boards. What can you do? Well, due dates. Put due date on it. Problem is that due dates, people don't remember dates when they're in the scrum board. So we started putting checkbooks on them. So as you lead into that date, you've got three days to go, start ticking it off. So you know you're coming up to the end of that date. This then moves, you can also track cycle time. This is a really simple way of doing it. Every stand up that card's on the board for, put a dot on the book on the card. You've now got a really simple way of tracking cycle time. If you want to get a bit more complicated, every state it's in have a different color for the dots. That's a fun way to see. You can do uh, simple CFDs with it, cumulative flow diagrams with it at the end of it, using the history at the end of the sprint if you wanted to, or at the end of some period of time. So onto the boards. Um, you do retros every sprint, or however you do them. You might do them uh, just ad hoc. How do you track the tasks? Well, there's a site called Scrum Plop, which is an odd sounding site, but it's patterns that um, quotes, high performance teams in Scrum use. Uh, it's set up by a series of uh, a set of coaches, including like the, the main Scrum people. And they meet every year and they put new patterns in. One of the patterns is scrumming the Scrum. How do you do it? Well, you put your improvements on the Scrum board just like you'd normally do. Take them through to do, in progress done, like you'd normally do. Again, you've got a board. Always put keys on your visualizations. So this is a, uh, let's say it's a Scrum board. Um, I've used this in the past to track bugs. So we've got red cards that are bugs. So at the end of the sprint, I can retrospect, look at how many bugs we had coming through. I'm also tracking rework. So when a card gets blocked for some reason, rather than like maybe putting it back to to-do or back into whatever, moving it backwards, I start tracking the work that I've had to do to get around that block. Those blue cards represent that rework. So it gives you a nice idea of how much rework you're getting into. We've also done changes, so a different color represents a change in some way, something discovered work, perhaps. That's an interesting statistic to look at. But you can see it very visually on the scrum, on the uh, on the scrum board. You can also get rid of burn downs. Um, there's a really simple way of uh, visualizing how confident you are that you're going to finish a sprint with smileys. Uh, I'll come to, at the end of the talk, I'll talk about the book that some of these come from, but they're called Confident Smileys. Simple thing, at the end of every stand-up, just put a smiley on the thing. How confident are you that we're going to finish this sprint, this story, this sprint? Obviously, you've got the smile, you've got the sad face, we're not going to finish, and there might be a meh face. Another thing is that uh, this comes from ThoughtWorks. Uh, they found their bug triage meetings were taking days, basically. They'd sit, and it's the familiar sight of sitting with Bugzilla, going through bug by bug, opening up a new tab, looking at it and going, oh, yeah, that sort of needs this, 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 blah, blah, blah. Well, I thought, how can we speed this up? So what they did is they visualized their flow on a big board. And now their bug triage meet is, they come and they look at these ones, the ones that they need prioritization, and they, so, and they put it through the flow as they need it. So it doesn't need more investigation. Well, put it on the needs investigation. Uh, from the needs investigation, it might get out, you might get some more things that need prioritization. Does it need to be fixed for current release? Yes, well, prioritize it. <coughs> no, okay, probably needs a bit of documentation. Mm, maybe not. Let's fix it later then. But it's an easy way to visualize it. You can also use whip limits, but with space. This is a crazy scrum board called the uh, Hourglass Scrum Board. So <laughs> rather than having a traditional um, just swim lane style, perhaps you have your backlog across the top. So uh, this might be the top of your backlog. You pull from there, perhaps. And what you're actually doing is limiting your whip things in progress with a box. So a story can pass straight through, but you can only do one of them. Or perhaps a task can, but actually you only fit in two, maybe three in that box. 
but it's limiting it by space. And then at the end, you have a nice big collection of the ones you've done to celebrate. You can take this to another level with Kanban boards. This is the Arrow Kanban board. So the Arrow Kanban board is, uh, oh, when I read about it, it's supposed to be a fairly advanced Kanban board. I don't know whether it's advanced or not. What I really like about it is there's a very clear flow. So A, it's an arrow pointing where you want to go. B, at the end, they have, usually have a target where the goals are. So the team know exactly what they're aiming for. Um, it's at the end of that thing, at the end of the um, arrow. You've got a standard board here, I guess. Explicit policies on every column. So every column, as you're going to go from column to column, these are essentially your definition of ready for the next column and perhaps your definition of done for that column. Uh, however you want to view it. Uh, you've got an expedite lane. And then you, again, they're using space to limit the whip here. So priority one, these are the ones you're going to pull from first. Priority two, priority three, and you can fit roughly that amount of cards in there. Talking about policies, there's an expression. Uh, if you haven't got a photo, you didn't do it. Same with policies. If you haven't written them up somewhere on your board, somewhere, these policies don't exist. Nobody cares about them. Write your definition of done up. Write your daily routine up. Write your working agreements up. Uh, otherwise, your team won't see them every day. They won't get reminded of them every day. They won't be talking about them every day. So policies should expire, because otherwise they get stale. So how would you expire them? Well, one way, if I go back a slide, actually, sorry, um, you can just put an expiry date on them. That's an easy way of doing it. So on the 18th of April, the team are going to get together, review their definition done. They might do it monthly, whatever. Another way of doing it is having a policy review queue. Essentially, it's just a set of squares with your policies in, and you rotate them every, say, week. And as they come through the thing, as they come through, they're going to doing. So you're reviewing it in the doing. You've got one going every week that you're reviewing. Um, if they need approval, you can have an approval step. Okay. If the team's doing it, they're not going to need approval. It's the team's decision. But you might have an approval step for some of them. Another one, and we've seen, seen these, it's funny the way visualizations, if you have a, a visualization that people use, it's like a virus, like suddenly everybody in the uh, organization starts using it. Um, we talked about this one on an offsite at DisplayLink, and it's now being used at, uh, by Mike, actually, Mike's team, I think. Uh, so Waste Snake. The idea is you just have this snake drawing on, the pic on, the, on your board. Uh, and the team will put uh, post-it notes along the snake. So from the head down to the tail. Uh, so the snake gradually gets longer. The idea is it doesn't get longer. Because if it's getting longer, you aren't actually getting rid of the problems you've got, or the waste you're doing, or the impediments you're tracking. The idea is it just stays at a reasonable level. Um, but you're exposing them. So that's a fairly negative way of looking at uh, impediments and stuff like that, because you're just, if, particularly if they're building up. But you can show them with what's, what I call an improvement ladder. I've seen it as an investment ladder as well which shows the opposite, so snakes and ladders. The ladders, every time you do something that gets rid of something on the waste snake, put it on the investment ladder. What did you do? How did you fix it? When you come to the review, you can say, look, we fixed this one, <coughs> so I'm here. Uh, you might have a team that gets interruptions, a lot of interruptions. You can try this, interruption buckets. Basically, they're buckets. So these are the people, that, or people or teams or things that are causing the interruptions. Every time there's an interruption from one of these areas, you put a ticket up saying what the, uh, the interruption is. But you have a, a limit at the top that says, once we get above, in this case, four. So if we put another one on, Bert's interrupted me again today. That's the time when the team get together and go, OK, this is, this is silly. Let's talk about it. Let's see what we can do about Bert interrupting us quite as much. But it just exposes the problem. You do a similar thing with dependencies. So if you imagine the team is at the center of the visualization um, and the dependencies you have are around in the spider, um, you can visualize them however you like. Um, but you have post-its on the, on the legs for every dependency that you raised, or a blocker, perhaps. Um, and then as you resolve them, you can keep a resolve table. But it's a very clear way of showing where your dependencies are, how big they're getting, how much people are really affecting it. So here, System X got, has got the most at the moment. Uh, although it's got not got very many resolved, uh, so I guess uh, yeah. Uh, one that came up on, I think it was ThoughtWorks again. Actually, they've got a uh, 
It's called the ThoughtWorks Radar. It's actually a quadrant on the radar um, that they do. Um, but I, I sort of looked at it and was thinking, oh, I could do that for technical practices. Uh, so what they have is they have four states for their practices. One's adopt, which means the team's taking it on, they're doing it. One's trial. These are the ones they're thinking about doing. So they're just starting having a look at it, see if it's any good. They've also got assessment. So assess is where the team are assessing whether they want to bring it into trial. So they just started thinking about it. And then there's the ones that actually, they may be tried or they may be thinking about trying at some point, but they're just going to keep on hold. So this is adopt, trial, adopt, trial, assess, hold. Uh, like I said, ThoughtWorks do a, a yearly radar uh, thing on it. So last few I'm going to skim through. Pie chart progress. Simple way of doing progress through um, a release. Just using the pie chart share. It's similar to the, pie, uh, to the parking lot diagram that you can, may have seen. Technical debt. Let's put pain and effort scale. So low pain, low effort, stuff goes here. Low pain, high effort goes here. High pain, high effort there. High pain, low effort here. Fix these. It's really easy. Low effort, but causes the most pain. Parking lot. You may want to park stuff that you're doing. Put in a parking lot by the side of your scrum board. Pairing matrix. Keep track of people that are pairing. If you want a team to start pairing, putting this up on the board makes them think about it, games it a little bit. Final couple, estimations. How do you keep a, a sort of standard set of estimations on your team? Well, as you estimate, perhaps put them up on a ruler so you've got a baseline that you can use when you're doing relative size estimation and keep that, the good ones that you found were definitely eight points, definitely one point. Keep that over a period of time. You'll find they just start to standardize a little bit within the team. Final one. From management three, I think. Uh, I think they call it the kudos wall, but wall of appreciation we've used. It's just somewhere where you can go up as a team and put kudos cards that they, they've actually got cards you can download on the site. But basically, thanks for doing this, or props for doing this, whatever, trophies, etc. Final thing. Most of these visualizations, probably about, maybe about 10 of them actually, are in this book by Jimmy Janelin. Um, they're just the ones that I've used. Um, there's quite a lot of the others that um, I've got. URLs for, which I might tweet later on if you're interested in seeing a bit more and reading about them. But have fun with them is the best thing to do, is all I can say. So, thank you. Hey. Brilliant. Marcus, that was fantastic. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to have the panel session in a sec, but a couple of questions specifically for Marcus. First. Come on. <laughs> Just the one. You have all of these in a whole building, don't you? <laughs> so, yeah. They're all over our whiteboards. Actually, we do. We've, we've got quite a few of these on the whiteboards at the moment, and certainly in display them as a bar. So, yeah, maybe even ten of them I know that are up at the moment. That are actually being used by teams. Like I say, I've used all the ones that are up there before, um, and many of the ones that are in that book um, that Jimmy Jannon wrote. Okay. Any more? Okay. Well. Uh, I'll just finish off the slides. So, uh, thanks tonight, obviously, to all our presenters. That's just been a, such a quality evening, uh, lightning talk. So, thanks, every one of you. That's brilliant. So, another round of applause, please. <laughs> yep. Excellent. And, of course, we're here tonight, Redgate. Um, so, thanks to those. Uh, Ben's organised that. It's fantastic. So, they've, they've paid on to eat your pizza, make sure it's all gone. Um, so next, next time, don't forget, we're, we're back here. We have been alternating uh, between here and Display Link, but uh, because we were ho hoping more people were going to be here, this is the bigger uh, space. So 26th of April, uh, Matt Jukes, don't forget that. So I've gone ahead, got ahead of myself. Uh, and yes, the other thing is, so tonight is uh, lightning talks, but we also do different uh, evenings. But um, please, we... we we we'll seek uh, volunteers from, from you lot to uh, present, uh, just run games, retrospectives, things we've done. But uh, please think about that in future, okay? So when we uh, ask, we'll definitely be seeking your help. And okay, we won't see you off in a minute. <laughs> We're gonna, can we have all the speakers, please, at the front for, uh, for the discussion? <coughs> Cheers. I'm not sure how you want to do the microphone, Ben. What do you reckon? Yeah. You allowed, you allowed to sit down? I don't know. You could uh, to, to take it easy. Let's just shift this other one. Let's 
put it that, that in, Ben. Okay. <laughs> All right. He's going to start. Um, I was just asking when you finished up about um, whether you'd see a benefit in sharing your victory goals, your personal ones, with the rest of the team. I know you're only a team, but would you see benefits in um, sort of promoting yourself within the team and so stuff a bit? The internal voice that we're talking about, the, the chicken move voice is saying stop bragging. It feels like, so to me, I'm like, no, this is what we're bragging about, how great I am. I'd probably be happier sharing the, the big books and other things I've done badly. But maybe, I don't know. Maybe a mix of the two, I don't, yeah. I just wanna... Again, compassion for self is harder than anything else. together as a team and we fail together as a team and we celebrate and we mourn all together as a team or not at all. And yeah, I'm, actually I'm going to take what you said on board. And it's my grave stone the white <laughs> 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 Spending some time actually helping each other get through that failure is, is important. Yeah, I mean, it, it sort of shows the value of the, the sort of the show and tell mentality when you're doing agile delivery because you know, if you don't regularly do that, and it's so easy for teams just to stop doing it and just plow on with the work. And I'm sure the teams do all that. But you've got to do that just to get some feedback and find out what is working and what isn't working. And that's getting that feedback and help you build confidence or what Well, there's no way of getting off them stupid. We have learned that. And we need to get up the sun. Yeah, it's good to share. I think the other thing I would add to that is, is that we are, well, some of us at least, uncomfortable about talking about our own successes. And that's where I think like your appreciation can be if you're in the team of more than one, where you can actually get people, people are more comfortable.
Okay. Sorry, question about. Okay. I do think as well that it does speak to there are larger organizational problems in that hiring is key and culture is key and you have to have a culture of making sure people are rewarded for being good to each other. Not nice but good. Rewarding compassion, giving feedback to people who don't behave as if their colleagues are human. And no as an industry I think teams, for example, know that I've never been a developer and I'm a software development manager. Work on it. Um, but they know that I don't come from that background. They do know, however, that I come from a test background. Um, and actually, I see not having been a developer, but being responsible for those teams' development as being a good thing. Because I'm always asking for them to explain it in layman's terms. And if they can't, then the chances are that we've over-engineered that solution. If you can't get it as a non-developer, we're not doing our jobs properly. So, having that open say to my teams, I don't understand what you're telling me. I think it's business. Okay.
wrote down all the things that we do and this is still associated. And then we just, I printed out little pictures of like buses and um, it, was, it was a really fun way to kind of visualize that. And I was wondering if you guys have seen anything like that um, in your research of visualization or on um, depth, um, depth sims, um, how do you visualize overlying on a team? Because that kind of, I guess, has more of a business case to um, compare and to I So the, the bus factor that in a retro to say, okay, well, how do we tackle this problem? How do we start to cross-pollinate the knowledge that these people have got across to other people? And how do we give them time to do that during normal day-to-day -day work or a two-week sprint? You, you have to take that hit at some point, because if not, if that hit by the bus thing becomes a reality, it's not just going to be your team that takes the hit, it's going to be everyone else that takes the hit. What's in that question? Is the development manager? Enjoys being a hero. There's having a hero. So, someone needs to have a conversation. Pace. But yeah, uh, having a hero is bad. And I've read a similar article for my comment that you know, having a hero in teams is mm. not a good practice. But yeah, people enjoy being heroes. So, one thing I don't know if you've ever heard from the Red Phoenix Project, and the, what, there, there was, there's basically a rewriting of the goal to strength of variety. And one thing they did, they had the hero. They disabled all of his passwords, all of his address, and if there was a thing only the hero could do, he had to tell someone or document it, someone else had to do it. And that's one way of dealing with people who are the hero, you can force them not to be the hero. And yet, some people like to be the hero. They just learn not to, and they're not. That's toxic. It is yeah. toxic. Okay, a uh, question over here. Was uh, yeah, I have a question. So I'm very new to Agile, so I'm on the way up to that, like, stupid mouse. It, it never ends. That man <laughs> Oh, I, I'm going to go back slowly. I'm at That's the bottom, I'm the bottom left. Oh, yeah. no, he's the most. Welcome to my So I'm really interested in the, you know, the talk about flexibility, and, and then, but I'm also thinking, from what I know about Agile, which is, is limited, it doesn't seem to me to be a model which in the sense that it's called Agile, but you have strict kind of ceremonies, strict kind of strict times that they're supposed to, well, maybe strict is the wrong way, then, as I say, I'm on my way up to the hill. But there's a lot of stuff that's kind of prescribed, but these are things you have to, and you know, you, you read, um, you should have a co-located team, and if your team isn't co-located, then you have to add in extra time, or that will fall delay, it won't get your stuff done. Mm -hmm. In many ways, I mean, in many ways, it sounds it goes against the idea of flexible working or um, remote working or uh, product. I'll do what I can do today, and then maybe tomorrow I won't do anything because that doesn't matter because I did loads of stuff. You know, so I wonder your, what your thoughts were on that. So I I have a real issue with some of the um, snake oil sales <laughs> that have evolved around agile <laughs> as, as an entire methodology because. Yes, I could go and buy a book tomorrow, I could go and hire a consultant for a couple hundred grand who would come in and tell me how to do the perfect agile
transformation or how to embed Agile in each of my teams. And do you know what? It would be exactly as you've described. It would yep. be very prescribed. There would probably be a framework in there. It would feel for the teams like they were being done to rather than done with. And it isn't organic and it isn't agile. Um, it's exactly what you've just said there. It feels very fixed and, and not flexible at all. You could do it that way. Sorry. Sorry, point, point over there. but they don't know why, they don't understand it. That's the big problem. Doing Scrum means much more, it's understanding the concept, why you do it, and it's aiming for productivity, but it's something, it's something that takes time. It takes a lot. I think the, the best description I've heard for any framework is that it's a playbook, and you can pick and choose what you want. Those, those frameworks were not made for us. Um, safe, less, dad, Scrum, um, but all of these were not necessarily okay. made for your company. They were made in a very specific set of circumstances for that company that decided to use that. Um, if you just lift and shift that into your company, it's probably not going to be as effective as it was where the company that created it used it. Um, so you need to be flexible. You need to kind of work around stuff that doesn't necessarily work with your team. Try it by all means, but if it doesn't work, it's like Roger said, it's a toolbox, and you wouldn't use a screwdriver to change a tire. You'd probably use something. Okay. So, so we're going to have to cut it short there. I think let it overrun already. So I hope, hope that's okay. You're not going to be too late. But uh, thanks again to the panel, and thanks to you guys for turning up. Brilliant. Pizza, please. <laughs> and uh, 
and uh, I will, uh, I'll work on the microphone technique. We'll, uh